This is CBC Nova Scotia News. Tonight's virtual urgent care hopes that new technology will speed up ER wait times in Nova Scotia. Alternative housing. A dozen people who spent the winter in their RVs at a Dartmouth campground push for a permanent setup. And out of this world, a Halifax anesthesiologist hopes to help manage pain in space. A few showers this evening and yes, chance for showers again on Wednesday, primarily in the east with a bit more clouds and yes, certainly cooler northerly winds. Your full forecast is coming up. Good evening. As the Canadian health care system struggles to deal with staffing shortages, many hospitals are seeing patients without access to family doctors showing up in emergency rooms. That's led some hospitals to turn to virtual technology. They hope it can move patients through ERs more efficiently. Shana Luck has that story for us tonight. So then from triage, we would move to the virtual care room right back here. It's become a part of nurse Samantha Langer's job to help patients get accustomed to a new experience at the hospital in Muscadabit Harbour. It's a small facility about 45 minutes from Halifax. She sets patients up by video call with a doctor working far from this hospital. Like They're like, that's so cool, didn't know this even existed, I get a lot of that. It's all part of a program called Virtual Urgent Care. Nova Scotia Health says it's in nine hospitals and patients who present with issues like coughs, colds and urinary tract infections can use it. The goal is to give many emergency departments in Nova Scotia the capacity to offer this by the end of spring. So we expect that any time somebody can be seen virtually, they should have that option. So we anticipate that you know by the time it's fully scaled across every site, it may go to 100 visits a day. Uh, in the near future. That's what we are thinking. From virtual doctors to a virtual waiting room. At Toronto's Humber River Health, a team is developing an online platform that can help triage people. It'll offer less urgent cases a time slot, allowing them to wait comfortably at home. And we thought, why do we do this to people? What, why can't you sit at home or go to a Tim Hortons or whatever it might be and have a more relaxing time than sitting in a waiting room? He says if the technology is a success, it could be scaled to other hospitals. Understanding when patients are arriving could help the hospital be better prepared to treat them when they do arrive. In both of these new programs, officials hope managing the way people move through the ER will lead to improvements for the health system overall. It's too early to assess the effectiveness of the systems, but those measurements will come. Shana Luck, CBC News, Halifax. The 2024 federal budget has been officially delivered and there aren't many surprises. The government has spent the last two weeks announcing $38 billion in new financial commitments. The big question has been, how will they be paid for? We're driving the kind of economic growth that will ensure every generation of Canadians can reach their full potential. And we're making Canada's tax system more fair by ensuring that the very wealthiest pay their fair share. In the weeks before the budget announcement, the Prime Minister and several Cabinet Ministers toured the country. They announced several spending programs aimed at getting more housing built and making it more affordable for first-time buyers. They also unveiled spending on national pharmacare and school meal programs, defence and AI. We'll have more details on the federal budget later in our broadcast. People who've been living in RVs this winter in Dartmouth need to leave by the end of the month. The pilot project is wrapping up, but some participants are calling on the government to do more. With more people turning to RVs as an affordable housing option, they'd like to see a more permanent solution. Nicholas Sagan reports. As she tears down the insulation that kept her warm all winter, Carrie Steves feels triumphant. It feels good that so many people told me that we couldn't do it and that it, it, it was not doable to live in a camper for the winter and I knew that it could be done and that it's, you know, we survived it. Not only did we survive it, we thrived. Steve's led the charge for the pilot program that let 12 people spend the winter in their RVs at Shuby Campground in Dartmouth. But the program is over at the end of the month and everyone has to move. So Steve's and her neighbours are calling for a more permanent setup for the growing number of people who are turning to RVs as housing prices climb. I think you're going to see more people that 
are going to be removed from their homes and, you know, the camper is going to be a solution. Jeremy Vanden Eyden was removed from his home by a run eviction, and the $250 monthly lot fees made the RV life appealing. He thinks expanding Shuby Park or building a new winterized campground could bring the same relief to others. It's going to help with the housing crisis. There's a lot of people living in these right now. At, uh, I hear there's a couple of RVs at the uh, at the ball field encampment. Um, there's people living in overpasses. They're going from Walmart parking lot to Walmart parking lot because. There's nowhere else to go. So is there a demand? I think there is, unfortunately. Uh, Area Councillor Tony Mancini has supported the project since day one. He says he would like to see it expand next year. Regional Council has been looking into zoning changes that would allow RVs as permanent residences. But Mancini says creating a year-round setup wouldn't be easy. I think something like that could happen. They should be talking to the province. They have provincial campgrounds that may that are much larger than the Shuby Park campgrounds. Last year, the province gave nearly $200,000 to help keep Shuby Campground open through the winter. But a spokesperson would not say whether the province will help create a year-round campground for people struggling to find housing or if the funding will be renewed. Nicholas Sagan, CBC News, Dartmouth. Staying with housing, a controversial pallet shelter village for Cape Breton is one step closer to being realized. The province and nonprofit group behind the project have a new location in mind. But as the CBC's Kyle Moore tells us, not everyone is happy about it. Call home. CBRM Councillor Lauren Green looks over a letter he was sent by one of the residents living in Pine Tree Park. The former federal radar base not far from Whitney Pier is the new proposed location for 30 pallet shelters. My issue is that, uh, you know, residents here are uncomfortable. Um, you know, nobody is comfortable with the way this is being unfolded by the province and uh, New Dawn. Initially, the provincial government and New Dawn Enterprises had set their sights on a different location, Railroad Street in Whitney Pier. But pushback from residents derailed those plans. Green says it's not so much the location he's concerned about now, but the shelters themselves. The province has vacant homes now through Island Housing, through CBRM, that they can put people in right now, as you and I are speaking. So it's not about wanting housing, it's about making them look good, is the way I look at this. Pallet villages are made up of individual living shelters with shared bathroom and laundry facilities. They also have round-the-clock staff to support the people living there. New Dawn CEO Eric Shea says the new location makes sense. Pine Tree is semi-secluded, but it's also part of a community. It's also a place where village residents and village staff um, can build relationships with neighbors, can be part of the activities that happen up at Pine Tree Park. So the best of both worlds. New Dawn will be holding a private meeting next month, open only to those who currently live or work at Pine Tree Park. Shea is hoping the pallet project will move ahead by June or July. From the beginning, we have said uh, this can't happen soon enough, and um, we're eminently confident that it can be delivered safely um, with digni dignity uh, and excellence. Kyle Moore, CBC News, Sydney. In an email to CBC News, a spokesperson for the Department of Community Services said it's finalizing details on the Pine Tree Park location, including site design and land lease. The statement went on to say, New Dawn, the Ally Center and Cape Breton Regional Municipality are incredible partners who understand the needs of our province's most vulnerable people, and we look forward to supporting their efforts to help people experiencing homelessness in Cape Breton. The governments of Nova Scotia and New Brunswick have signed an agreement to begin the early planning work required to upgrade the Chignecto Isthmus. When the work begins, it's expected to take 10 years to complete and could cost $400 million or more. A spokesperson for the Nova Scotia government says pre-construction work is already underway. The province said last fall that a plan for construction and tenders for the work could be ready by this November. The massive project is necessary to build up and strengthen the dike system that protects the thin strip of land connecting Nova Scotia to the rest of Canada. $36 billion in goods passes along the isthmus each year, and without the upgrades, that corridor is at risk from severe storms. The provincial government is providing money to create a new position to help municipalities regulate coastal development. 
The new Coastal Protection Coordinator will be hired and employed by the Nova Scotia Federation of Municipalities. The province is covering the cost about $476,000 over three years. The Federation says they hope to have the position filled by June. The priority will be understanding municipal needs related to coastal land use planning. Environment Minister Tim Holman announced in February that his government would not proclaim the po Coastal Protection Act and instead leave it to municipalities to determine what rules should be in place. And I'll talk to Carolyn Bolivar Getson, mayor of the municipality of the district of Lunenburg, for her reaction to the new Coastal Protection Coordinator position. That is our newsmaker just after 6.30. And Ryan is here with the weather and not too bad an April day out there. Yeah, some April showers certainly. And at one point today uh, here in the Halifax area, anyway, it was uh, showering pretty heavily and the sun was shining at the same time. So uh, it was that type of a day for sure, especially for uh, eastern and central areas of the province. We actually even had a couple of lightning strikes with a little cell that moved through Guysborough County earlier. Uh, so yeah, it is active out there for sure. And where those showers have been coming down, they've been coming down at a pretty good clip. Uh, they are, you can see, moving to the east here, and we've been looking at uh, that uh, lots of sunshine for western areas of the province. Now, what is going to be happening here is this low pressure system that's off to our north now, and we're still in its wake with those showers. Uh, it's going to be slowly but surely moving to the east, but you see this high here? It is basically set up a wall, a blocking high, and so that low is going to move to the east of Newfoundland, and then it's going to sit and spin for a couple days. What we're going to get in the wake is more northerly winds, so a cooler day setting up for tomorrow. Gone are the widespread double digits and teens. Uh, we're going to be mainly into the mid single digits across the north and east and high single digits and low double digits in the south and west, uh, that northerly wind will certainly have a bite. And yes, those are a few flakes possibly mixing in along the Northumberland shore up into Inverness County for Wednesday. Uh, the best chances for that will be in the morning, but yeah, could even see some of the, uh, those little ice, uh, sorry, snow pellets or grapple mixing in uh, for Wednesday as well. So there's the setup. Again, more unsettled here in the north and east. As we look ahead to Thursday, we're going to be watching again a brighter sky as that system slowly but surely moves off to the east. High pressure moving in, a nice quiet Friday as well. And then you see that line of green working its way to the east just in time for Saturday, Amy. But the weekend is not a write-off, which is good. We'll explain with your seven-day coming that, up. That is good news, but no one wants a write-off weekend. No, it's true. Okay, thanks, Ryan. Thank you. Well, RCMP say they've charged three people with first-degree murder in the 2022 death of Barry Albert, also known as Barry Mosier, in western Nova Scotia. A fourth person is charged with accessory. Albert was reported missing to Lunenburg RCMP on August 28th of 2022. His body was recovered more than a month later on October 8th in 2022 in Springfield. A massive operation over two days led to the arrests of four suspects. They remain in custody and are scheduled to appear in Annapolis Royal Provincial Court on Wednesday. Police say based on the evidence gathered, they expect more arrests in the case. Two people in Halifax are in hospital with serious injuries after a three-vehicle collision this morning that involved a Halifax transit bus. The crash happened at around 11 a.m. Barrington Street was closed between North and Cogswell Streets for several hours. Police were asking people to avoid the area. By early afternoon, traffic on the Halifax-bound McKay Bridge was at a near standstill. Barrington Street reopened to traffic at around 2 o'clock, and police say two people remain in hospital with serious but non-life-threatening injuries. The Halifax Mooseheads have fired their head coach. Jim Midgley had previously served as head coach for the team during the 2017-2018 season. He rejoined the Mooseheads this past season after serving as an assistant coach for the New York Rangers in the NHL. The Mooseheads announced the change in a news release this afternoon, saying it's decided to move in another direction. Assistant coach Liam Helis is also being let go. The organization says efforts are beginning immediately to find replacements. Increased interest in space travel has some medical professionals concerned about health issues arising once in orbit. An anesthesiologist in Halifax is researching how to administer regional anesthesia in a microgravity environment. 
which means testing the procedure underwater. We visited his team at a research pool in Dartmouth to learn more. I hope to see someday somebody doing a very accurate and effective nerve block in space. I'm John Bailey. I'm an anesthesiologist here in Halifax. I specialize in acute pain medicine and regional anesthesia, which means putting local anesthetic beside a nerve in order to create an area of numbness on the body. And today we're here to test some of those techniques for use in space. So the end goal of this research ultimately is to have a fall safe plan for astronauts. Pain control is not only important in terms of their experience if they're injured, but also in terms of safety for the crew because pain does have a variety of negative consequences on the body. Okay, so we're gonna do our first of a couple of tests today. So we're just gonna load all our gear up, do a quick uh, safety check before we go, make sure we have all of our gear and then Underwater. Underwater is similar to a space-like environment in that we're floating, the patient's floating, and our gear is floating. So this is more similar to low Earth orbit on the International Space Station. It's dissimilar in that we can't talk to each other, so we have to use hand signals, and we're looking through goggles most of the time. So it's not perfect, but it is good. I'll give it like looks good. Okay. You lift a figure, I'll inject. Oh, okay. So there are many limitations to pain management in space right now. There's a few things that are a problem. So any pain medication that you take orally or by injection, that it works on the whole body, is sedating at the least and at the worst could cause confusion or impairment of cognitive function, which could really impair mission safety. So this is the model set up. We've got um, Buddy here as our patient. And that's where our meat models come in. So we have tendon to simulate nerve and beef to simulate muscle and then encapsulate that all in ballistics gel to keep it clean so that nobody minds about us taking fresh meat into a pool. So the equipment involved in this is an ultrasound and then we use a small needle that is echogenic, means that it's bright on ultrasound, and then place that and we inject what's a simulated local anesthetics. It's actually just dyed fluid to see where the needle is and whether it's accurate. So we're gonna go nice and slow. I can now see the needle beside the nerve. So then I would indicate to inject some local anesthetic and I would make sure that I see on the screen that pool of local anesthetic going around the nerve that I'm trying to block. Once that's done, the needle comes out and that's it. The first study we had experts doing this, but very likely we're not going to be chosen as astronauts, unfortunately. It's going to be somebody that meets all the other criteria and then will be taught to do these procedures. So our next step is to bring in people that are very good divers, so that takes that out of the equation, but aren't familiar yet with nerve blocks, but we'll see whether they can do it with the same accuracy that we can. Coming up, Israel's war cabinet met again to discuss a potential response to Iran's weekend airstrikes. It's day two of jury selection in Donald Trump's criminal trial in New York. No jurors were picked yesterday and more were dismissed today. And Ryan's up next with the full weather forecast. We will see you on the other side of the break.
All right, so you were talking about some active weather in parts of the province, but other parts of the province are seeing a different story. Yeah, that's right. Uh, pretty much everybody had a taste of sun today, but it was uh, really quite nice down the south shore mm. and into the Tri-County area. That's where we had uh, the you know most sun today, and it's still lovely mm. at this hour. Have a look at uh, this live shot from Nova Scotia webcams. Oh, wow, that could be August if you didn't know. Right? <laughs> Just run out there, <laughs> run back in, run really back quick. out really quick. Yeah, it would be uh, more of a polar dip, uh, certainly this time of year. Uh, that is beautiful Lockport Beach and uh, still double digits. Yeah, we're getting there. We're getting there for sure. Mostly sunny skies. Water temperatures, as you will see in the local forecast uh, in a moment, are around four degrees there <laughs> on the south it's a shore. Cold it's a bit chilly, uh, but uh, yeah, like we said, we are making progress now. If you're wondering what's going on here, well, uh, yeah, there's a bit of an issue, unfortunately, with uh, the temperatures across the country right now in terms of uh, those temperatures coming into uh, the weather graphic system. And so you're not really seeing uh, much there. You can see uh, temperatures. Yes, we do have a couple of stations online. Shetta Camp at 9, Shelburne at 14. Uh, and yes, uh, it's a similar story with the winds. Not getting that data into our weather system, uh, though you can see the winds 24 at uh, Shelburne. Uh, but uh, yeah, uh, we'll hope that that issue is resolved sooner than later. But uh, certainly we did have today kind of widespread double digits and yes, uh, some teens, especially down towards the south and west. This is where we've had most of the action in terms of the showers and a couple of heavier downpours here, uh, especially eastern shore and into uh, the Guysboro County area. There's that area of high pressure we talked about, the blocking high. You hear me mention those uh, that phrase is so often, it seems over the last a couple of years, as these uh, blocking systems seem to set up shop uh, more and more often. Uh, this is the low that's coming into the region, and it is not going to be moving anywhere. Is it going? To, it, I mean, it will get to the east of Newfoundland, and then it will sit and spin there. And we're just going to get into this northerly flow on the back side of that low. Uh, this next system is going to be working its way into the region as well, but it won't be re really making much uh, headway over the next few days. Again, you can see uh, no problem with the American temperatures. Uh, it's the temperatures across uh, uh, our country here that are struggling to make it into the weather graphic system uh, currently. Now you can see tonight we're going to be looking at temperatures ranging between 2 and 5 degrees. So a fairly similar start in terms of temperature wise to what we had today. Northwest winds 10 to 20 kilometers per hour, but they will certainly be uh, continuing through the overnight tonight. This forecast model, high res, doing a pretty good job uh, with those showers through this evening. And by the time we get to tomorrow morning, again, pretty cloudy in Cape Breton and along the Northumberland shore, a pretty nice start for the rest of the province. But we're going to be watching with that northerly flow coming in, the clouds building up into the afternoon, especially for central and even towards the valley. It looks like uh, the Tri-County area and the south shore will do uh, pretty uh, nicely for tomorrow. Uh, hanging on to, I think, at times, a mostly sunny sky with just just some clouds in the mix, but that cloud will be pretty stubborn here in the north and east. This is where we are looking at the best chance for showers and yes, even a few flakes. Best chances are going to be Inverness. Uh, higher terrain areas, uh, no doubt. The highlands, the best chances. Temperatures will range from 5 to as warm as 9. Could even see some double digits here in through Richmond County tomorrow and uh, inland areas of Cape Breton County. Now for the Northumberland shore temperatures five degrees here and again a few wet flakes possibly mixing in here as well. Uh, we'll be looking at temperatures milder eight nine degrees for the valley re, uh, for the uh, valley tomorrow. Amherst to Truro likely near six and seven double digit potential Yarmouth Kedgy Shelburne up towards Bridgewater possibly possibly the metro area if we get into a little more sunshine based on uh, the sun that I'm seeing right now in the outlook I think we'll we capped around eight, nine degrees at uh, uh, in the metro area anyway. Now, as we look into the Thursday time period, you can see clouds fairly dominant again to start, but a little brighter into the afternoon. And so we'll call this a mix of sun and cloud. And we are looking at temperatures that are going to be as mild as 10, 11, 12 degrees. Still pretty cool in the north and east with that lingering northerly flow. Area of high pressure will continue to settle in for Friday. And then we've got this next system that's going to be moving in just in time for the weekend. Saturday does look wet. Periods of rain off and on. Uh, drizzle intermixed with that as well. But the good news is it's a quick moving system and it looks like we'll be back into the sunshine on Sunday. Amy. Sun for Sunday sounds good. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> okay, thanks, Ryan. Thank you.
Well, up next, I'll talk with Carolyn Baller-Rigetson, mayor of the municipality of the district of Lunenburg, and I'll get her thoughts on the creation of a coastal protection coordinator job funded by the province. Stay with us. The Houston government is providing money to create a new position to help municipalities regulate coastal development. The new Coastal Protection Coordinator will be hired and employed by the Nova Scotia Federation of Municipalities. The province is covering the cost of about $476,000 over three years. Carolyn Bolivar Getson is mayor of the municipality of the district of Lunenburg. So first off, can you give me your reaction to the creation of this new coastal protection coordinator? Uh, originally when I was speaking to the uh, provincial government not moving forward with coastal protection regulations, I spoke of the need for municipalities to have resources uh, to be able to implement a coastal protection bylaw or to deal with this uh, at the local level. Uh, not all municipalities do have those resources and that can be anything from staff resources to the financial uh, resources to do this. So putting a 
coordinator in place uh, is something that hopefully will be able to aid municipalities in rolling out whatever coastal protection bylaw they're looking to do at this time and maybe regionally approach this as well. Uh, because again, we were looking for a provincial set of regulations so that if regionally municipalities can do this, it makes sense as well. Well, what kind of help do municipalities need and, and do you think this is, is enough or is it a start? It definitely is a start um, for municipalities to figure out exactly and for NSFM because NSFM is the organization that will be looking to uh, put this coordinator in place in conjunction with the provincial government's financing to roll out to see what municipalities are looking for and to make sure that what that is, uh, they're able to accommodate. So the original plan to uh, get the coordinator in place as quickly as possible, I think is very, very important. And I believe the NSFM is currently working on that job description to roll out, to engage with municipalities, to get the information that will be required to see what this position actually looks like and what, uh, need is there but for municipalities. Well, can you talk about the kind of threat that coastal erosion uh, poses to a municipality like yours? Well, it's pretty evident that after we went through the wildfires in the area that borders on us, uh, from the coast, uh, even inland flooding from July 21st to the, uh, from Fiona to the tropical storms. We have an active hurricane season here on the South Shore or in Nova Scotia as a whole. And I think that municipalities are looking for that protection so that they can put things in place to protect uh, landowners from uh, storms as well as move forward with having that protection for erosion and elevation setbacks and all these things that will be necessary as we move forward. Uh, these storms are not one in 100 year storms anymore. These storms are coming on a regular basis and we need to be prepared. Well, does this new position offset the province's decision to abandon the Coastal Protection Act? Offset? Uh, we definitely, again, would have liked to seen the province roll out provincial regulations so they were the same across the uh, province. Our municipality has been working to put in place a set of coastal protection or a coastal protection bylaw. We hope to have before council next week. Uh, having said that, the numbers that we are using are definitely different than the numbers that the province are using, and we have we had them in last week to look at how that difference and what they were using for their data compared to our own. So I think that as we move forward, it's definitely going to be important. Uh, to have the information before us before we move forward with creating these bylaws and so on. So the collaboration, I think, is a step in the right direction uh, to put money there to help municipalities do this. But again, until we know and determine the status of the coastal land and the land use bylaws and what needs to happen, uh, it's hard for us to determine exactly what this position even looks like, but I know that a coastal protection, uh, protection coordinator is definitely going to be the first step in moving forward. All right, well, Mayor, thank you very much for your time today. We do appreciate it. Thank you. Coming up, coral reefs around the world are undergoing a mass bleaching due to climate change and warming oceans.
And welcome back. The 2024 federal budget has been officially delivered and there aren't many surprises. The government has already announced several programs. The big question though was how they'd be paid for. The CBC's at Rafi Bujikanyan reports. Mr. Speaker, we are acting today to ensure fairness for every generation. With multiple announcements over the course of weeks aimed at addressing Canada's housing crisis, the government has revealed how it plans to pay. To responsibly build a fairer future for younger Canadians, we need to make sure our tax system is fairer. That means going after capital gains, like the sale of a secondary home for the country's wealthiest and corporations. Individuals to pay taxes on two-thirds of anything they make above $250,000 a year. Businesses fully moving to that rate. This new revenue will help make life cost less for millions of Canadians, particularly millennials and Gen Z. Support for the Liberals with that demographic has plummeted in opinion polls. The $23 billion housing program in this budget hopes to win them back. $8 billion of that in spending, the rest in loans. Ottawa even wants to convert some underused Canada Post and military public land into housing and spend up to $500 million to buy unused public land from provinces or cities. For this observer, an obvious play. Targeting the main political areas, I think, that are really challenge this government, like, like housing and affordability, might not even be in their jurisdiction, but they're responding to the need for action by Canadians. Certainly the text emphasizes uh, the demographic that's, I think, become a little distant from this government. But to even get there, the minority Liberals need opposition help to pass the budget, and it's not clear they'll have any. This is the ninth deficit. The ninth deficit after the Prime Minister promised the budget would balance itself. Conservatives will vote against this wasteful inflationary budget. We have some serious concerns and I want to hear from the Prime Minister what his plan is to address those concerns. With surveys also showing concerns over too much spending, the government does not want to increase its $40 billion deficit this year. This may not be the last pre-election budget the Liberals are planning, but they are banking on it, paying off for them at the polls. Rafi Bujikan, Young CBC News, Ottawa. Canada's overall inflation rate ticked up slightly in March to 2.9% from 2.8% the month before. Despite that, there's growing confidence the Bank of Canada could soon cut interest rates. Nisha Patel has more. Canadians paid more for gas last month. Air transportation and restaurant meals were also more expensive. But one of the biggest drivers of inflation these days is the cost of shelter. My rent went up $700 uh, for the same same space. Uh, so it's pretty frustrating to see what's happened in the last few years. It's impossible to rent an apartment unless you're a two-income household. I don't really spend money if I, if I can help it because, I, I mean, uh, things are getting tougher and I only assume they're going to get more tough, right? Rent prices climbed 8.5% compared to the same time a year ago, and the cost of interest on mortgages was up more than 25%. Still, the overall inflation rate is inching closer to the central bank's target, and officials say the trend is encouraging. Measures of core inflation did tick down again, and that does suggest that underlying inflationary pressures are continuing to ease. So uh, we continue to be moving in the right direction. The Bank of Canada could start cutting interest rates as soon as June, even before inflation gets back to 2%. But some risks remain. We can't forget what's going on in the Middle East. Uh, you know, if we do get another shock to oil prices in particular, uh, that could be, you know, that essentially throws uh, everything out the window. And economists warn that while interest rates went up quickly, it's unlikely they'll come down at the same pace. The bank is going to take its time, making sure that we're not going to see a, you know, a resurgence in especially real estate markets. Though for Canadians weighed down by the high cost of borrowing, a little relief could go a long way. Nisha Patel, CBC News, Toronto. Turning to the latest from the Middle East, Israel is standing firm on its promise to retaliate against Iran for Saturday's massive aerial attack. But it's unclear what that response will look like and when it will happen. The CBC's Chris Brown reports. 
Israel's military apparently pulled this intercepted Iranian ballistic missile out of the Dead Sea, putting it on show to demonstrate how much damage it could have done. It's a dangerous escalation. Iran says it was Israel that actually fired first by killing two of its generals in a Syrian diplomatic consulate on April the 1st. And its foreign minister continues to warn if Israel retaliates, Iran's response will be immediate and severe. But before Saturday night, Iran had never directly hit Israel. And Israel's leaders are now trying to build a case at simply letting it go to de-escalate, as many countries, including the United States, are urging, is not an option. On a visit with new military recruits, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu tried to connect Iran's attack to Israel's now six-month-long war against Hamas in Gaza. Iran stands behind Hamas, behind Hezbollah, he said. It's part of a much bigger system. This former Israeli diplomat says Netanyahu will do whatever is most likely to keep him in power. He will be trounced in any election, which is why he's trying to prolong the war in Gaza. Which, we, which is why he's trying to maintain a war atmosphere via Iran, because that, that postpones uh, um, every, every uh, um, uh, political play. For the moment, Iran has shifted the focus off Gaza and the immense criticism Israel has faced for the destruction and suffering it's inflicted. But Alan Pincus doubts Israel can avoid Gaza for long. If Iran goes away, he gets the accolades for, for exercising your strength, but then attention goes back to Gaza. He loses. If he attacks Iran, he loses. Uh, he's in a no-win situation. In Tel Aviv, people were anxious, but many also supported a reprisal against Iran. A targeted strike like that was the best move, and a continued targeted strike is the continued best move. It shows measure without overplaying a hand. I believe that if we do violence, it will uh, drag more violence, and I don't believe that we should continue doing so. Several European foreign ministers are reportedly making their way to Israel to make their case in person that Israel should consider the larger strategic issues. Chris Brown, CBC News, Jerusalem. This was day two of jury selection in Donald Trump's historic criminal trial in New York. The former U.S. president faces 34 charges in connection to a hush money payment to adult film star Stormy Daniels. Trump maintains his innocence. Some accountant, I didn't know, marked it down as a legal expense. That's exactly what it was. And you get indicted over that? Twelve jurors and six alternates are needed. Six jury members were chosen today, but not before the judge warned Trump against jury intimidation after he was heard talking toward a prospective juror. Trump is accused of falsifying business records to cover up a $130,000 payment to Daniels, allegedly in exchange for her silence before the 2016 presidential election about a sexual encounter with Trump a decade earlier. He's pleaded not guilty and denies any such encounter with Daniels. Well, Canada is coming off its worst wildfire season on record and one of the deadliest. Eight firefighters and contractors were killed on the job. And preparations are underway for another long, hot, dangerous summer. A group of new firefighting recruits is wrapping up their training in Alberta. And along with the physical demands, they're learning about the mental hazards that come with the work. The CBC's Julia Wong has the story. Aaron Kurd says this is where he belongs, on the front lines of the wildfire fight. I was actually watching the media uh, about last year and I saw, how, uh, I saw how the wildfires were impacting the communities here in Alberta and how it was actually impacting the rest of Canada as well. I felt like that, uh, that this could be a cause that I could uh, contribute to. Kurd, who used to be in the military, is among more than 500 people trained this season to work with helicopters, lay down equipment and respond to fires. But Kurt says he's been preparing psychologically as well. I like uh, taking my own time, really separating myself from, um, from my job sometimes if it gets really busy, and then uh, just focusing on myself and what I need to do. Last year, Canada saw its worst wildfire season in a century. Fires started early and were unrelenting. With dry conditions in Alberta, this year may be no different in the province. Because the seasons are longer and more intense, uh, it requires us to be very clear about what fatigue and cumulative 
fatigue looks like, be really clear about some of the mental health issues that can come as a result of working extended shifts many days throughout the entire summer. Make sure that we've got a little slack in the hose there. And mental health is one of the things instructors want recruits to be more open about. We always talk about uh, the hazard of fire behavior, slip trips, falls. The mental health hazards are equally important and we need to make sure that we're trying to get that into our everyday conversation. That's not to say the physical risks of the job have been forgotten. Eight people working on wildfires died last season, according to a report by Natural Resources Canada. We certainly are, are open in talking about the past as a learning experience. Uh, so what can we learn from those really unfortunate um, deaths, fatalities, serious injuries? For Kurd, even with all that considered, he's ready for what this season could bring. We're all very aware of what we have moving forward um, and just keeping healthy, um, keeping, our, keeping our morale up. A job that could see him working for weeks at a time, putting the lessons he's learned to the test. Julia Wong, CBC News, Hinton, Alberta. Coral reefs help sustain life in oceans, and now scientists say this crucial ecosystem system is under further threat as reefs around the world experience a fourth mass bleaching. And it's because of warming oceans brought about by climate change. Anand Ram reports. The iconic Great Barrier Reef, lively, but among the colors all this ghostly white, signs it's struggling once again. Right now, we're, we're currently experiencing a global scale marine heat wave that is unprecedented. Scientists say hot ocean temperatures have affected corals in every ocean, calling it the fourth global bleaching event on record. And they're seeing more and more reefs affected every week. So if that trend continues, this event will be more the most spatially expense, uh, expansive uh, global bleaching event on record in as little as a few weeks, potentially. Corals, both organism and habitat to a quarter of all marine life, are very sensitive to heat. Marine heat waves can last for years. They're sitting in these elevated temperatures for very long periods of time, becoming physiologically stressed. That stress can drive away fish, and if temperatures stay hot, eventually kill the corals. Which would disrupt the tourism and recreation for nearby communities, but also a vital food supply. We know that fish um, provide valuable protein and micronutrients. It's unlikely that you'll find a substitute that'll be equally as nutritious and affordable for local communities. Still, there is hope corals can recover if temperatures stabilize, but that could take more than a decade. And scientists are seeing climate change increase the intensity and frequency of bleaching level heat. When bleaching occurs more frequently, there is just no energy, no time for corals to recover. And as oceans absorb the excess carbon from humanity's greenhouse gas emissions, scientists warn these beautiful marine forests are being pushed closer to extinction. Anand Ram, CBC News, Toronto. It's time to take a quick break now, but first, here's a look at how the markets did today.
All right, so we had sunshine, showers, and you said at one point at the same time? <laughs> yeah, for sure. Didn't spot any rainbows, though, unfortunately, I know, today. Uh, it's usually... usually usually get that, don't yeah, you? Yeah, with mm. the sun and the rain at the same time. But uh, anyway, we'll uh, rainbow watch tomorrow, yeah. uh, potentially in central and eastern areas where we'll again see the chances for some showers. Have a look at our viewer picture of the day. And this is a beautiful one. We're going back to the metro area for this one from Dartmouth. And yes, food ah, purpose is on the That's what go. those showers bring, right? Yeah, that's exactly <laughs> right. And those are beautiful, nice uh, so purples. Uh, lovely, lovely. Thanks to Susan for sharing the Excuse me, that photo and uh, to everybody, Ryan's Picks at CBC.ca that the mailbox has been uh, filling up nicely with uh, your signs of spring and always love to see it. Temperatures in the northeast tomorrow ranging between, yeah, five, six, seven degrees. It'll be cooler, closer to three, right in those onshore winds from Inverness County to Anaganish and across that Northumberland shore. Now, temperatures will be milder, high single digits along the South Shore region into the valley and certainly uh, the, uh, the Halifax area as well, high single digits there. Uh, best chances for double digits will be Bridgewater back to Yarmouth, as you can see there. But the northerly winds will certainly uh, make their presence felt. Uh, similar story for Thursday, lighter winds, but still a factor. And we will see temperatures at least uh, closer to, uh, to double digits in through uh, places like, you know, Kentville. Uh, but it's still going to be a little bit cooler in the north and east. Watch those shower chances, uh, which will be lingering into tomorrow. Not as prevalent as they were today, no doubt. And then as we uh, move into Thursday, again, uh, some clouds lingering in the east, but overall a much brighter day. And that next system is going to be approaching the region uh, for the Friday night, but looks like more so for Saturday morning. And it does look like a damp day Saturday, <laughs> but as we uh, were advertising earlier, Sunday is looking good. So we'll hang our hat on that. We, we will take that for sure. Okay, well, the Olympic torch has been lit, the relay is underway, and the countdown to the 2024 Games has begun. Usually the power of the sun is used to light the flame with a parabolic mirror, but it was too cloudy in Olympia, Greece today. The 2024 Paris Games start on July 26th, and you can watch all the Games action right here on CBC. And that's it for us tonight. Thanks so much for watching. We'll see you next time. Good night.